Hi everyone, I'm Jenna. I'm a registered veterinary technician and a certified rehab practitioner at SOAR Veterinary Services. I'm here with Christina, who is an RVT and also a certified rehab practitioner, as well as the founder of the rehab service at the Toronto Humane Society. Christina is actually a good friend of mine. Uh, we met in vet tech school where we instantly bonded over our desire to do animal rehab. After graduation, Christina and I headed down to the University of Tennessee where we both completed our certified canine rehab practitioner program together. Uh, since then, Christina and I have teamed up to lecture at the National Animal Welfare Conference and in 2019 and more recently the 2020 OABT conference. Um, so I've always admired Christina's passion and determination for shelter medicine and her ability to provide rehab therapy to not only rescue dogs, but cats and even rabbits. <laughs> um, I'm excited to have her here today so she can share a bit of her journey and inspire everyone out there who's wanting to do rehab in a shelter setting but just not knowing how to get started. So if it's okay with you, I think we'll just go ahead and get started because I've got a few questions for you. All right, hi everyone. So our, my first question is, um, I know everybody that you talk to in rehab says they kind of have that moment where they just, they realize this is what they want to do for the rest of their life. I know I had that. Um, so just wondering what made you want to pursue a career in animal rehab? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there was definitely that moment. Um, I, I uh, did kinesiology in university um, because I thought I wanted to do physiotherapy, something along those lines. Um, but when I graduated, just didn't really feel that um, that passion, um, I guess, that I was hoping to feel after. So took a break to do something fun and chose to become a dog walker. So uh, I remember I, I had these two clients um, that were uh, a brother and sister lab pair and went to go pick them up one day and only the brother was able to come. And when I asked why, um, they said that, uh, you know, Mandy couldn't come because she hurt her knee, she had to have surgery. And instead of her walk, she's going to have to go to physiotherapy for a while. So it was kind of in that moment that I was like, mind explosion, like, hang on a second, you can actually do this for dogs. Like I had no idea this even existed as a as a career. So um, did a lot of research after that and kind of totally changed my my path um so that was definitely the moment and then uh went to vet tech school so that i could enroll in the university of tennessee uh rehabilitation practitioner program and so how did you end up at the toronto humane society was it, did you always want to go into shelter medicine or was that um, just kind of where you ended up and how did your career kind of evolve there from being a new tech to running the service that you're running? Um, I think, uh, you know, a, a friend had done a, a placement at the shelter and they said they they really loved it. So I, I just um, uh, did a one year I did a one-year contract there, you know, wanted to utilize the tech, uh, the tech skills that I had learned, um, was still working on the Tennessee program. So, um, so yeah, just kind of, just kind of wanted to see what, what shelter life was like, you know, always interested in, in, in rescue, um, adoption, things like that. Um, but didn't know how much I'd actually love working in a shelter until I, until I started there. And so I know that, you know, at SOAR, we see a lot of um, conservative management of cruciates and, you know, neuro patients and things like that. I'm sure you see a completely different patient load. Um, so what are you typically seeing? Like what type of injuries and patients are you typically seeing in the shelter? And, you know, how are you treating those dogs what do your treatment programs look like for those patients? Um, well, sometimes they come in and, um, you know, we're, we're trying to decide if surgery is the right path for them. Um, so uh, sometimes we'll, 
we'll start with a, a conservative uh, program. Um, we, we it, it, it's kind of it's all it's all tailored individual individually to to the the, the patient. Um, uh, sorry, you asked if we see these patients. What types of patients like do you do you typically see come through the doors like? Um, Oh, uh, like what types of injuries do you usually see? Uh, yeah, quite quite a variety. So so yes, sorry, we do see, uh, you know, your your CCL ruptures. Um, we do see quite a few FHOs for the for the various hip issues, um, whether it's like a traumatic femoral neck fracture or um, you know advanced hip dysplasia. Uh, seen a few leg perths um, cases. Uh, so I guess some of some of the, the more common um, injuries in in these guys. Uh, sometimes we do get like emergency cases. So like you're hit by car dogs or your uh, your balcony fall cats. So um, rehabbing fractures, uh, broken pelvises, uh, fractured um, fractured limbs. Um, there's uh, there's like some weight loss cases, you know, like the obese, diabetic, felines that come in. So we want to get those on a weight loss program for sure. Uh, even like kitten season, you know, we'll we'll often see those like swimmer kittens, um, the occasional swimmer puppy, uh, cerebellar hypoplasia. I've seen that. Um, what else is there? So how do you manage um, those those hit by car patients because they they must have multiple injuries coming in? Often, yeah, I mean, often they do, and then you know sometimes there's uh, neurologic deficits, you know, um, you know peripheral nerve damage, things like that that we're also trying to work through. Um, uh, even the wounds that sometimes are associated with some of these more traumatic cases. So there's like a degree of wound management as well. Um, but yeah, it can be it can be challenging when there's yeah more than one uh, more than one injury, I suppose. And do you find in in the shelter setting, do you find that these uh, these dogs often get treatment for those multiple joints, or um, how does that really work? Oh, oh yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think just to, to, to back track a bit, I mean, um, a lot of these, a lot of these patients are, uh, you know, like the shelters in a new environment. Um, some of these guys are experiencing, you know, different levels of fear and anxiety and stress. So, um, I think we take it a little extra slow with them. Um, maybe, you know, uh, just in, in, in doing their rehab, I'll, I'll try to prioritize, you know, I guess, um, what's, what's most important for them to, to, to start. And, um, uh, sorry. Um, we, we, you know, we want to, we want to prioritize their, their emotional well being while we're helping, you know, manage their physical, physical pain. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, and, and so what types of, uh, what types of treatments do you typically t give these guys? Like, what do you have available to you? Cause I know that I'm, I'm assuming in a shelter, uh, things are a little bit limited and your, your resources are probably a little bit limited as well. So what type of equipment do you typically work with? Uh, I mean, now that, uh, I've been doing this for, for a few years, I feel like I've accumulated quite, uh, quite a few things in in uh, the rehab toolbox at the shelter but uh, I mean when when it started you know we just started with like you know your thermotherapy your cold packing um, heat packs um, man manual therapy uh, those are like probably some of the bigger and and more um, more uh, important ones at the at the shelter uh but in terms of uh like modalities we do have a uh a three B laser which I'm so grateful for because I can use it on so many patients to help them. 
uh, with their pain and speed up their rate of recovery so we can get them into homes faster. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll do, uh, I have a little e -stim machine that uh, we can use for helping with uh, preventing that muscle loss uh, after an injury or surgery, or uh, I can use the 10 setting for some extra pain relief. Um, and then we've got a uh, treadmill. So, you know, once they're at, at that stage, you know, we, we can use the treadmill and get pretty creative on the treadmill. It just started with a sort of uh, uh, hand-me-down human treadmill that I'm positive was built in the 70s. Um, a little, a little clunky, but uh, we made it, we made it work. And that got replaced eventually with uh, a, a dog treadmill that somebody had had given once they were they were done with it. You know, again, second hand donation, uh, missing a few parts, but still functional. And uh, there's there's so much we can do with the land treadmill. Um, sorry. Do you find that you, do you find that you find yourself needing a water treadmill ever, or do you find like that the land treadmill is enough for you guys? Uh I mean, I would love one, um, you know, sometimes wish I had one for sure. But uh, I mean, we're, I think we're doing great things with, with, uh, with what we have. Um, if, you know, if, if an animal gets to a point where, you know, we're kind of using everything that, 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 that I have at, um, at the shelter, and, you know, feel, feel very strongly that, the addition of hydrotherapy might help then um, on a, on a case by case basis, we might, you know, try to work with an external uh, facility to make that happen kind of like collaboratively uh, water-based uh, mm -hmm. there and focusing on land-based stuff kind of at the, at the shelter. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in the summer we've got kitty pools outside. So we try to incorporate a little bit of a little bit of water therapy or with some smaller patients, sometimes, uh, you know, filling up one of our one of our big basins um, can actually can actually uh, work work pretty well. If, you know, we're trying to get um, some swimming in or something like that. Just got to just got to get got to get creative with what you have <laughs> or bathtubs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Done that before. Yeah, and I actually um, rehabbed one of her dogs in her bathtub. Yes. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it did really well. Um, yeah. She's doing great, and uh, she has a wonderful home now. Yes. Um, Spoiler: It is my parents. My yeah. Parents <laughs> yes. She's doing well. Um. So if anybody listening has, you know, uh, exercise equipment that's just laying around collecting dust, um, probably from the, the 70s, um, lying around, how do they, or can they um, donate that to you? And if so, what kind of things do you think that you could use or what, what are you in need of right now? Um, I mean, if there, if there is anything that, that, that somebody is looking to um, offload, uh, they can definitely send, send me an email. Um, I just don't know how how that's working right now. I mean, often you can just drop drop donations off. At the mm -hmm. shelter, but I'm not I'm not too sure how that's working given current circumstances. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they can feel free to email. I think you can pass on my email afterwards. Um, Will do. Yeah, because I've 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 accumulated quite. I've I've developed a keen eye for keeping my eye on the donation bin. So um, I've got quite a few things, but I'm always sort of looking for, for backups because we do put a lot of our animals into foster homes. So uh, sometimes I'll even try to supply the foster parent with, with things that they can use with their, with their foster pet um, at home. So. Uh, I do uh, think I make very good use of of some of the things that we can repurpose even through through donations. Yeah, like there was that uh, I walked by one time and there was all these different size foam blocks, kind of like the ones that you would uh, you know use in your elementary school PE class. 
And it's like these things are so great for, uh, you know, using them for for rehab exercises. Um, yeah, like a bunch of things come in. Yoga mats are great for increasing traction, even in their in their um, you know their runs or their modules while they're at the shelter and mm -hmm. also landing home. You know, everybody's got hardwood floors now, so yeah, helping their environment while they're at the shelter be as you know comfortable um, and conducive to recovery as possible, mm -hmm. and also trying to carry that over into their foster homes as well. Perfect. Um, we have a question here um, okay. from someone um, asking, how did you get in to do rehab at the Humane Society? Did you approach them or were they looking or seeking somebody who was looking to add it? Oh, um, uh, so, so yeah, when I first started working there, it was, yeah, just that, you know, that, that year um, contract. And during that time, I actually saw how, how much need there was and you know um i think our 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 vet techs and stuff uh were uh you know applying some principles like you know trying to do the range of motion but um you know it's a it's a it is a busy it's a it's a busy shelter so um kind of like as that as that year was was winding down um knowing that i would be certified shortly um, I did a little bit of research, kind of made somewhat of a, of a proposal and, uh, you know, uh, like management was very receptive, um, super supportive of it. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of how, how it got, how it got started. I think, you know, you're in the position that you're lucky to, because the Toronto Humane Society is so good about um, just trying to always trying to provide the highest standard of care. Um, because even, you know, before I remember, um, when I just started doing rehab, we were also working with the Toronto Humane Society. Mm -hmm. And so this is going back, you know, um, six, seven years now that they've been doing rehab. And so just recently, I feel like rehab has come to the forefront of medicine, uh, vet medicine, and the Humane Society has been on board for for years now. So. Yeah, I mean, bef before we started doing in house, um, I believe you know animals on a on a on like an as needed sort of case by case basis, um, you know, would be um, uh, sent to have you know rehab done um, elsewhere. Uh, but once we started to do it in house, it uh, it sort of I think uh, 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 you know we're helping more animals um because the other thing too is that i think you know when you're giving owners homework right um you know at the, at the shelter we're kind of all their their sort of surrogate owners right so that that uh you know home therapy home exercises that you would kind of expect uh you know owners to be continuing in between your sessions we're kind of responsible uh, for for that as well, right? Yeah. So, um, do you find that uh, you're doing most of the rehab, or do you find that you're you've gotten to the point where you're delegating a little bit to either the other techs or the assistants, or you know um, whoever else um, are taking care of those pets? Um, it 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 does vary. Like, um, I I mean, honestly, the. I rely very heavily on like, uh, yeah, uh, the other staff members for sure. But like the, the foster parents, once, you know, we try to, if, if we know that there's an animal that's going to have a longer recovery, we, we want to try to get them into a foster home. Um, so uh, I think relying heavily on, on foster parents to um, help provide that daily support. And then they'll come in sort of, you know, once to twice weekly, whatever we decide, um, whatever, you know, our vets decide is, um, is a, a good treatment plan for them. Um, but uh, I do try to, you know, prioritize getting to, to all my patients uh, on a daily, on a daily basis, the ones that are in house. So um, how would that work when, so say, you know, you had a, an animal that was in shelter and 
Um, the dog had a TPLO, so a cruciate repair surgery. Um, would that, so after that patient was discharged from the hospital, that patient would come back um, to you and would you rehab it or does it go out to foster or does it depend? How does that work? Uh, normally they would come back um, and we would just make sure that, you know, the incision's looking good, that they're, uh, they're at a good level of pain management. Um, and then sort of, so when the, the foster parent would come pick them up, the discharge would be with me. So we would kind of go into, into depth about uh, the home program, um, the, you know, a, a lot of these, a lot of these patients, we um, sort of sometimes know that they're going to need surgery. So um, just in trying to be proactive, we'll do uh, some prehab and sort of, you know, as the foster parents, I, I mean, I feel like the, the, the foster parents are just so awesome because it's, you know, it's this new, it's this brand new animal and they've, you know, maybe have like a, you know, an ouchy knee. Um, so in part of our prehab, we'll sort of just do some kind of desensitizing to having that limb touched, you know, getting used to the massage and all the, all the therapies that we're going to try to incorporate after the surgery so that it's not so much of a, not so much of a shock, I guess, <laughs> once they're, once they're post-op. Um, so I just, I know you have, you know, cases that you've been seeing for a really long time, um, and you keep in contact with all of your foster parents and adopters, um, on a regular basis. Um, what, and I'm thinking of one specifically in my head that I know, um, we've used in our, uh, lectures before. Um, I think his name is, uh, I'm not sure of his name, but, um, I don't want to say it and it's wrong, but. Um, I know this dog had a, um, a brace made for him. Um, yeah. For him. Um, and it just, can you talk a little bit about that and how, you know, the shelter supported that, um, that, you know, custom fitting and how all that, how that dog's rehab went. Cause I think it's a really interesting story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was like a, a, a brachial plexus injury after, um, after being hit by a car and, um, you know, we, yeah, because, you know, n nerve injuries can take um, some time to improve if they're going to improve. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, um, he made, uh, you know, a lot of improvement. This was a, this was a case, you know, um, and, and sometimes this happens on a case by case basis where it, um, you know, he had a committed adopter kind of on board already. Um, because as you know, uh, having an animal that has like a, an orthotic uh, brace, something like that, that they're gonna need to use long-term requires a lot of um, owner owner compliance. Like it's, it's the responsibility of the owner to ensure well, that they're- to your, to your pet and their care, right? Yeah, to the, um, yeah, you know, making sure that it, the, the skin underneath and all that, making sure that the fit is proper, um, you know, if, the, if it needs to have any any repairs, making sure that's done. So we were quite confident that this um, individual was was um, on board with that because otherwise I think this, this dog was probably looking at, um, you know, considering uh, amputation. So um, we we had him fit for, for a brace and it just, you know, it, it helped him stay on four legs, um, so it was a uh, yeah, it was a kind of a great outcome for for that dog, and the adopter is really happy. Um, and he's in the yeah. long term, or was that something that he re was able to rehab out of? Um, uh, the the last we checked, he's still still using the the brace. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, he still kind of had those leftover deficits, but I mean, he he didn't didn't break his spirit in the slightest yeah. so yeah perfect um so his and maybe not him specifically but um your your typical foster parents are they people that seek out um to foster an animal that has um a mobility uh disability or are they just people that 
you know, come in looking for a dog, they fall in love with this dog and then find out that um, this dog is in rehab. How does that work? And, you know, do you find that um, it works? Do you find that there's a difference in compliance or dedication for people that, you know, come in looking for an animal with um, mobility impairments? Um, well, our, um, like our foster department is great at, at matching, um, at matching, I guess, foster parents up with, with, uh, our animals, you know, we will, we'll say sort of what the, what this animal needs, you know, what they're recovering from, what that might entail so that we can try to find, uh, find somebody who is, um, able to provide that that care um you know like it's a it's a on a volunteer basis right so um i think we, we sort of put out there who needs who needs foster and for what and um and then uh the the foster parent uh will sort of express interest like you know if they if they can provide that care we'll also sort of specify you know that this will have to come in for however many appointments per week, you know, making sure that their schedule allows for that so that we can continue to, to sort of work together to keep on, keep on top of the animal's progress. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that we can get them recovered and eventually into a forever home. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, that's great because I'm sure there's people out there that, you know, they're, they're looking to provide that type of care to, um, to an animal, right? Like, you know, um, there are people out there that are willing to deal with all of those, you know, wounds that they need to manage and, you know, braces they need to put on or booties they need to put on when they go out for a walk and things like that. Um, so I'm sure that you have, you have a ton of people that come to you and say like, you know, um, that, are, that actually are like seeking out an animal in rehab, right? Yeah, I mean, like, I think people, people want to help. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I don't know, I, I, I think it's a really rewarding process to, to be able to help an animal through this, you know, kind of transition phase, you know, of, 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 um, you know, for whatever reason they've had to come into the shelter. Um, and I don't know, I find it, it also just sort of really amplifies that, that human animal bond as well so i mean i think maybe i'm biased i mean i think i think it's fun to help an animal through through <laughs> rehab and um yeah i'll get like sort of repeat uh rehab foster parents you know so like by now some of some of these some of these um foster parents are really really kind of you know don't even need to really be shown how to do the passive range of motion yeah, anymore. It's like, experts by then. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's, it's really, it's really helpful. Um, yes. Yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's so great. <laughs> do you think that um, because these, you know, um, or the animals that are in rehab or in a foster family that's going through this rehab process with them, do you think that there is a link or a relationship or, you know, um, and does it affect their adoptability at all or? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, while they're going through this recovery in a home, then, I mean, on like one, it, it helps us get a sense of what, what this animal is actually like in a home so that eventually when we're, when we're matching up with a, you know, potential adopter, we can, we can give them some kind of real life info on, on what they can expect um, from this animal in a, in a home. Um, it's always nice when you kind of, you know, what, what we affectionately term foster fail. <laughs> right? I think because of that, yeah, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I think because of that, yeah, that amplified uh, bond of, of going through that with, with this animal. Um, but uh, I mean, in terms of their their recovery from you know a, like a mobility um, you know impairment of some kind, we're we're trying to get these animals to sort of be at their optimal 
level so that they're they're ready to find their their forever home. Um, I mean, especially if it's, you know, potentially that is the reason why they ended up in, you know, being surrendered in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I can speak to that. Um, I mean, I came out of after I finished my CCRP, I was like, I want to foster because we, we were working with the Humane Society with you guys at that point. And I remember saying, you know, I wanted to uh, take in a foster dog. I've never done it before. And I wanted a dog who was in rehab because I had just finished my certification. I wanted to apply my skills, all this stuff. And I took this dog home and within two days I was signing the papers for adoption. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just the, the process you go through. And I mean, we can say that, you know, we, we know that as people who do rehab, but when you live it, you, there's this bond, there's, this, you, it's an unexplainable bond with this animal that you've helped them through this. You have this common goal um it's just like it's so unreal it's amazing. yeah yeah and i think you know it's uh you, one of the one of the challenges in a shelter versus um like a, a clinic where you would have a, an owner bringing bringing their pet in right for uh you know for for treatment mm -hmm. whereas um you know we're kind of missing that 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 owner factor um, and some of these guys, we don't really even have much of a, much of a history on them or like really limited medical records. So, yeah. um, so yeah, it, it, uh, it can be, it can be a bit challenging. So, uh, we have another question here. Someone, um, is asking what your favorite rehab success story is from the shelter. I know that's going to be extremely hard for you oh. <laughs> because you have so many of them that have gone so well for the dogs. So, but if you can pick one. Shoot. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. Oh no. We're not um, going to hold you to it. <laughs> sorry. So we're not going to hold you to it. We're not going to tell them. <laughs> um, uh, or even one that you think would be interesting for people to hear about, um, one that people you think people could relate to. Um, I mean, we one one of my I guess one of my first cases as a uh, recent rehab grad um, was was a dog um, that came from like a, a sort of a, a remote community. Um, where there's like a lot of free roaming dogs and uh, he came in kind of on, on three legs, like I guess had a um, previous injury that didn't allow him to use one of his, one of his hind legs. Um, and so he uh, only had one functional hind leg and that leg actually had um, a torn cruciate. So he was um, in a bit of pain there. Um, so I guess, you know, he ended up having a, a, a TPLO. So rehabbing like a three-legged dog um, where their operated TPLO leg is their, is their only leg. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just um, the, the, happiest, the happiest dog and went to the most amazing family. Um, and uh, this one just just sticks out because they did sort of reach out afterwards. And because um, I think when he first went home with them before he had the surgery and all that, I think I kind of, you know, talked the ear off about what to expect, um, what the process would be like, what the, what the unknowns were, I guess, for him. And once he recovered, like sort of once he was cleared, uh, they, they, they admitted that they felt like they were uh, in a little bit over their heads, but sort of the support that they received through through the process, they just, um, they were just so, so grateful that they had, they had this dog. Um, and yeah, it was just, I don't know, it was just, I don't think I explained that very well, but <laughs> it no, was but just, it was just, um, I guess, amazing. So there were, it seemed like there were so many un unknowns and he just sort of like, yeah, I guess exceeded everybody's expectation. Beat, beat the odds. Yeah, it seems so. Yeah. Um. So, um, 
my next question would be, um, so what are some of the struggles that you typically encounter when you're treating uh, your shelter rehab patients, if there's any, uh, whether it's, you know, behavior or um, foster parents or, you know, uh, different injuries, what are the, the struggles and kind of how do you deal with that? Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, they might also be going through like a, a behavior modification program. Um, so I work really closely with our canine and feline trainers. Uh, and it's sort of more of like a, a collaborative approach to, to make sure that, um, that it's as, as least stressful, uh, you know, for everyone um, in sort of getting that animal what, what they need. Um, challenges. Uh, I mean, I know like um, at, at SOAR, we've always got, you know, an assistant there with us. Do you, do you typically have someone or um, are you by yourself? Because, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure you deal with, you know, some dogs that, that do have aggression issues and that can be scary when you're <laughs> by yourself. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, but usually, you know, it's something that, that is known so you can kind of tailor your approach yeah. accordingly. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to spend time getting, getting to know them, you know, kind of like not pushing them past the point where they're comfortable. Um, sometimes, yeah, it sort of depends. It depends on the, on the case. Like some animals are kind of better when it's just sort of like a one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. situation, but um, I do have some, some volunteers uh, as well that have been super, super helpful. Um, just, you know, just just some that are just passionate about, about animals mm -hmm. um, at the shelter anyway. Uh, but we've had some that, you know, uh, you know, a certified in canine massage or um, acupuncture or um, uh, even like animal chiropractic, uh, physiotherapists, you know, and these are your um, volunteers? Sorry? these are your volunteers, some of them. Yeah. Some of them. Um, and so, so they're also super, super helpful. Um, yeah. And, uh, I mean, uh, other staff members as well, um, you know, are really great about, about helping if, if I, if I do need some yeah. assistance for sure. And, you know, how do you, how do you deal with uh, the dogs that that are, you know, maybe not aggressive, but a little bit anxious, and are, you know, not not wanting to be touched? I know you probably answered a little bit of that before, but uh, yeah, I mean, like there are some animals. I mean, you know, cats as well. Yeah, you have quite, you know, quite a few cats that need rehab as well. So. Um, sometimes like a more hands-off approach is definitely, uh, better, um, just less stressful, uh, you know, if just, or fi finding their motivation to get them to participate in an exercise that maybe would accomplish what you're trying to accomplish with, you know, hands-on, uh, manual type therapies, um, yeah, yeah, just, I guess, like, not pushing them, sort of giving them some time to just decompress, even. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, like, often there's there's other things, I guess, going on, like, you know, if we'll, we'll have um, animals coming from, like, hoarding situations. Um, yeah. You know, it can be, it can be quite a learning curve, or, yeah, like, these um, animals that come from other shelters or rescue organizations or, or, um, you know, other, other areas sometimes coming into the city can definitely, you know, they'll, they'll need some time to, to decompress. So I guess just not trying not to force anything, you know, keeping the, the whole welfare of the animal, um, in, in mind, like mm -hmm. at all times. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think somebody just uh, wrote a question for something you had just said about cats. They asked, do you mostly uh, rehab dogs or do you treat a lot of cats? Um, I know you've treated a rabbit. So can you tell us about that? Because I know that oh, yeah. 
me pretty excited. <laughs> yeah, the uh, rabbit was one of my one of my first cases actually. Um, kind of just had uh, a pretty severe head tilt uh, and some some mobility. She just like wasn't really grooming. She just, I mean, um, wasn't really using her litter box. Um, so, you know, she's still, you know, we tried, you know, we just laser range of motion, uh, like every, anything we would, we would be doing with our dogs and cats. And, um, she did make quite, quite a bit of, uh, improvement and eventually got adopted, um, to somebody who continued, uh, her, her home rehab program. Um, that was, a, that was a lot of fun to try to use things like, you know, herbs and carrots to convince her to jump over the cavalettis. It was, it was hit and miss. Sometimes the cavalettis were um, just a nice chew toy. Um, but even just sort of setting her enclosure up so that she could engage, you know, she had to kind of uh, you know, do more foraging for her food, move, move um, to various bowls more or, um, setting up little obstacles that she'd have to navigate around to kind of encourage her to, uh, to move in certain ways. Um, so yeah, there's that in terms of, you know, dogs versus cat cases, it, it, it totally varies. Sometimes I'll have more dogs than, than cats, but, um, it kind of, it, uh, I don't know, like it's, I feel like maybe there's, there's a bit more canine patients, but I think I think we're we're coming a long way in sort of I guess how we see how we see cats and how we you know sort of um, approach approach feline um, mobility and arthritis and um, you know weight loss and all that. So. Yeah, I don't know. So are, are those with your cats? Are those usually what you're seeing is arthritis and weight loss or? Um, yeah, I mean, like lots of weight loss cases, lots yeah. of weight loss cases. And, you know, you kind of have to be really specific and really on top of their monitoring their progress, as you know. Um, uh, yeah, like, you know, the hit by car cats or um yeah those that kind of fall from from uh balconies you know see quite a few cats needing fho's um and those are really fun to rehab <laughs> um <laughs> yeah um yeah amputations like you know we do yeah. see quite a few um uh animals needing uh a amputations um yeah, the occasional sort of like uh, neur neurologic, neurologic cat, like just sort of a little bit unbalanced, I guess. Um, yeah. And so with your weight loss cats, um, I mean, I know like it's a it's a long process, right? So I think it's not to me, it wouldn't seem feasible to keep those cats in the shelter until they get down to their ideal weight. So are those, those cats, when they're adopted, are they, or going into foster, are they being sent home with a weight loss program? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, even just like the other day, we did like a, a virtual adoption where, um, cool. uh, yeah, uh, you know, we've got like a, a weight loss spreadsheet uh, that, you know, we, we sort of to, to get them started and just so they can kind of see how long it truly can take for cats to lose weight yeah. uh, safely. Um, but they'll sort of get to, get to my, my lecture of, uh, you know, if um, like you might have to consider like a, a therapeutic diet, like strongly encourage them to reach out to their, um, their regular vets to inquire about, um, you know, their, recommendations for for weight loss but letting them know the benefits of of therapeutic diets and weighing foods just sort of um educating them in what they what their options are um in caring for this and caring for this animal and continuing their their weight loss journey post adoption perfect um we have another question so somebody must know that you're the dollar store queen 
<laughs> so uh, somebody asked, um, knowing that you have to work in a very on a very tight budget for equipment, what are some of your favorite dollar store hacks for equipment or supplies? Oh, geez. You got tons of those. I know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm single-handedly keeping dollar ram in business. Um, yeah, they sell they sell pool noodles, right? Pool noodles you can use for um, a variety of things like uh, inexpensive sort of uh, cavaletti rails, step overs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, even I just like they have different kinds of like ice cube trays you can sort of use in, in lieu of like a, a Kong or something, right? Where you can, <laughs> when you're trying to, you know, perform a, a treatment on an animal, you need to keep them focused on their uh, yummy treat. Um, so there's different kinds of like mats that they have. Uh, I really like to, um, if we have uh, a cat that uh, needs a little bit more help with traction, uh, shelf liner can actually, you know, it's sort of like a like an ultra thin yoga mat, so you can kind of like customize it to their to their little space, their little module. Um, I have two that I just from working with you um, kind of like blew my mind a little bit, and I use a, more now as well. Um, is I remember you buying this little piece of AstroTurf. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you can tell us a bit about that. And then um, the other one is when we were rehabbing um, uh, your, your parents' dog in the bathtub, um, we used a, a dollar store Easter bag. So if you can maybe right. the crowd yeah. on you um, MacGyvered those into uh, some rehab equipment, <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, I mean, so like, I mean, I was surprised to see AstroTurf at Dollarama, but of course had to buy it because um, I'm kind of always looking for things that have different textures, you know, for those animals that need a little bit more of that proprioceptive kind of input. Um, so yeah, so AstroTurf, it was just to sort of switch up the substrate that the, you know, um, animal was walking on, uh, which you can also do with like the different kinds of bath mats that they, that they have, um, or, or like different mats in general. Um, the, those sort of reusable um, grocery bags. This one, it happened to be around Easter. So there was an Easter bag. Um, uh, you know, the right size for this puppy that, 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 yeah, we were working on sort of cut out the holes for her, for her limbs and her head so that we could safely suspend her in, um, in the tub for her hydrotherapy. Um, but I've also used this on uh, cats that, um, you know, maybe recovering from some kind of spinal trauma, they're not as ambulatory yet. So you can kind of, um, a lot of, a lot of these bags are, are perfectly cat size. It's just a matter of <laughs> trying to guesstimate where you cut the holes out mm -hmm. for, um, for their limbs so that they comfortably fit in it. So you can do that daily sort of assisted standing type exercises as well. And I think that's great because, um, I actually use it to recommend to a lot of my clients is if they, you know, can't afford or they can't find a balance disc that we use, you know, when we're doing gait patterning on balance discs with the, the little nubbies on them um, mm. for uh, hind end feedback, um, I usually I'll tell them go and look for, you know, those welcome mats or AstroTurf at the dollar store. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's, pretty valuable for it's, you know, anybody can go to a dollar store. Um, not everybody has rehab equipment in their house. So I think that's a great hack. Yeah. Suddenly you start seeing like inspiration everywhere. Like I yeah. could use this <laughs> for that. So I could use this. Yeah. Um, so my next question would be, um, so if somebody after, you know, listening to you um, and they want to get involved and they want to, become a foster parent for a um, an animal that's in rehab right now, how do they go about doing that? 
Um, uh, you could become a foster parent first. There is a bit of a, a process. Uh, you can um, go to the Toronto Human Society website. There's a tab um, called Get Involved. And so there are um, there's more information about how you can become a volunteer or a foster parent. Um, if you have any trouble, you can for sure just shoot me an email and I can try to uh, connect you with the, the right people. Um, it is helpful to know if you're specifically, you know, wanting to foster animals that are, um, you know, going through a rehab program. Um, my email is rehab at torontohumanesociety.com. So um, feel free, feel free to reach out um, and I can, can sort of point you in the right direction. Perfect. Um, and... So I know um, this is probably um, a loaded question, but uh, where would you like to see rehab go uh, at the Toronto Humane Society in the future? What are your goals for the department? Um, I, I mean, I think we've got a, a really good thing, good thing going now. I mean, I hope that personally I can just continue to advance my rehab education so that I can, you know, provide, provide, um, uh, you know, excellent quality, continue to provide rehab for these patients. Um, I kind of hope that maybe it will inspire other animal welfare organizations to incorporate some rehab principles into, you know, into their day-to-day -day operations. Um, uh, I mean, like it started super small and has has really evolved. But um, you know, you can do some pretty inexpensive uh, hot and cold therapy, even right? Like you can make a cold pack with uh, you know a freezer bag and dish soap or uh, corn syrup, which we uh, found out recently actually works yeah. really well to make a kind of um, cold cold gel pack uh, can, can uh, you know, I've had volunteers that will sew heat packs, um, you know, just like really inexpensive like barley or flaxseed inside and you can use those as like microwavable oat eggs. Um, volunteers have been super generous with their, with their time and their skills. Um, yeah, I hope that I don't know. I just hope we keep kind of raising that bar of what, of uh, you know, um, you know, standards for 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 shelter medicine. I think the bar is pretty high for you guys right now. I think you're doing a great job. Um, and what advice would you have for somebody who, after listening to this, is completely inspired, which I'm sure they are. Um, and would like to start a rehab program at their shelter or even just kind of gain access to rehab for those shelter pets? Um, I, I mean, I guess, I guess, uh, you know, talk, talk to your coworkers, talk to your vets. I mean, I, um, you know, the vets that I work with are, are so, um, you know, pro pro rehab um, obviously I couldn't do what I do uh, with with without them um, if you're if you're really interested in rehab I mean look into these look into these certification courses so that you can kind of get that educational uh, background if that's if that's sort of what you mean yeah. Um, yeah, and like, you know, so if for somebody who who's not a technician or isn't a vet but works at a shelter, um, you know, and are, they're wanting to get rehab for, you know, their post-injury or post-operative patients, um, what's a way that they could they could do that? Um, if they are a tech? Um, if they're not. So like if, if it's just, you know, if they're working at a shelter, because um, I know there's, there's shelters um, – you know, all over the, the country that may not actually have medical staff there, but how, how can they still get access to rehab? Uh, well, I mean, there are, you know, external facilities. Um, 
that uh, that you could um, you know start by I guess approaching. Mm -hmm. um, like I know you guys work with um, some local uh, yeah. rescues as well. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, I, yeah, um, I guess, I mean, like there's, there's even just like, you know, like the, 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 the basics of, um, just trying to make sure that, and, um, you know, these, these animals have like basic things like, you know, traction, the things that, you know, we would mm -hmm. recommend for home, home modifications, um, even like, you know, those, those big dogs with the, um, you know, elbow dysplasia will have like those raised feeders come in, you know, even just sort of, you know, you could supply them with that just alleviates a little bit of that stress on their, on their front. Um, yeah. Does that, I think there's, I think there's lots that people, people can do um, if, you know, they, they, they take the time to, you know, do the research and, and get the education. Um, just like, like you said, you know, the heat packs and the ice packs and the raised food bowls and the traction and all of that stuff to just, you know, it's to start, start small. And, uh, you know, it may seem like a small thing, but it can make big differences for these. Oh yeah. I think, right. Yeah. There's so much you can do with, with, you know, with not much really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little can definitely go a long way. Well, I think, you know, um, I think you, you are living proof that you can start small and start with providing these, um, these small things to these animals, improve their life. And then, you know, five years later, here you are, and there's, you've got an entire department and you're being able to provide in-house rehab, which I think is absolutely amazing. Um, I think not, I don't know of anybody else that's doing that right now. So I think this is kind of uncharted territory for um, shelters around the world. Um, and, you know, I think that it's something you should be like incredibly proud of that you were able to do that and so early in your career. So I just, you know, thank you so much for uh, being able to provide such great care for these, these animals because I think they need someone to advocate for them. And I think that person is you. Oh, thank you. These oh. animals are so amazing. Like, yeah, yeah they empower so, me every day. So I don't think we have any more questions. So uh, I just want to thank you so much for being here and letting me pick your brain and sharing your story and telling us everything you do for these amazing animals. So um, again, if anybody has any questions or wants to, you know, get into contact with Christina, um, she gave her email and, you know, you can always contact us as well. And I can connect you to her because I know she's got lots of, of info and rehab love to share to everybody. Yes, please well, do feel free to free, feel free to reach out yeah. uh, if I didn't answer your questions yeah. in my rambles. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think that's it. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, have a good night. See ya. Bye.